we're going to get started. Thank you all for being here. Um, we have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Michael Tomlin, who is going to give his lecture entitled The Exploding Middle Class. Everything you read about it, shrinking, is wrong. Can't wait to hear what that's about. <laughs> um, please, if you're interested, we have um, actually two more lectures this season. We've actually extended it. The very next one is April 25th on Tuesday night is Dr. Adam Kleinschmidt. Um, he is an assistant professor in biology, and his lecture is entitled Genetically Modifying the Deadliest Animal in the World to Fight Infectious Disease. Could be riveting. Um, and then we have one more lecture that we have added to our series. Dr. Stephanie Hilwig is going to give a um, lecture in talk, talking about rape culture, and that's going to be May 2nd. And I'll send out, if you want, um, I can put a paper up here if you want to put your name, and I'll, I'll add you to the listserv. Um, I think that would be a really um, important talk. Okay, without further ado, Dr. Calvin. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you and good evening. So, um, what I'm going to do is kind of pace around here and talk about things I have here, which I have for you on handouts that are both up here and in the back. And then I have artifacts that I'm going to show you. And on the handouts, most of the references that I'm using are there. So if you have interest in, uh, in that. Appreciate you coming. It's kind of fun to look out here. And I see a lot of friendly faces. I also see some of my students. And uh, maybe they are also some of the friendly faces. Um, but you just, don't, uh, you just don't know. The exploding middle class, everything we hear about is that the middle class is dying out. The middle class doesn't have a chance. Um, the Democrats claim that um, going back to the Reagan tax cuts, it killed the middle class. Okay? The Republicans, they blame former President Obama. Okay, what's happening to the middle class? I'm going to say they're both wrong, but there's a couple of caveats that I have to go with. First, the guidance that I got from Courtney on faculty lectures. They're not specifically research talks to technical audiences. They're layman level discussions of a topic you personally find interesting. Now the rule about personally find interesting means that I would be here tonight talking about it if you didn't come. So I find it personally interesting and that's what I'm supposed to do is entertain my personal interest. If it entertains your personal interest, I'm glad you're here. That works too. It doesn't even have to be your field. It is not. So that should make it even more interesting. It could be your favorite hobby. It is not. We're going to talk about my favorite hobby. Anything you find interesting and exciting. What could be more interesting and exciting than the economics of the middle class? Well, maybe there are things that could be more interesting and exciting. Um, so full disclosure. The economics of the middle class is not my field, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. It's kind of cool. You sign up, they let you talk, you don't have to know anything about it. It's a great life. Uh, but then I am a professor, so you know, that's pretty much how we make our living. But I am not an economist, okay? However, I did get a good night's sleep in a Holiday Inn Express, so I think I'm okay. Now, for those of you who are youngsters, maybe 30 and below. I did not get a good night's sleep in the Holiday Inn Express. That was a TV commercial that they ran for years and years about someone that was pretending to be a surgeon, pretending to be an airline pilot. Are you a pilot? No, I'm not, but I did get a good night's sleep in a Holiday Inn Express. So those are my qualifications to be here tonight. So, we're going to kind of get into the mood here on middle class, making it in America, all of those types of things. Oh, gee. 
John Conley, 
But when you start getting older, you start asking questions about things. And you are taught by other people that you are rich or you are poor or whatever. So, I would think, boy, that Oklahoma wind doesn't have to be cold, too cold in the winter for that wind to come sweeping down the plain, I think is the way they say it. Um, and lo and behold, I would think, if only we had a garage to keep the car in. We got to go out and shovel out around the car and do all of that. And in the summer, the car sets up there. Doesn't matter if you have a carport. The sun's going to get it from one angle or another. A carport really is, is about half worthless. And I would talk to my dad, say, so daddy, how come we don't have a garage where we can drive in the car? His answer, son, those are things rich people have. Oh, okay, and we were not among them. So that's one of the things that, that I learned. So I started early on thinking, someday I'm going to be rich. That's what I want to do. And that then was, that means I would have a garage within which to park my car. I know what the definition of rich is. So then it progressed from a garage. We got a house with a garage. Was I rich? No, dang it. What would I see? Other kids, Little League Baseball, Scouts, they had two, two garages. You're kidding me. Why in the world would you have two garages? And then I discovered some of them had two cars. You're kidding me, rich people. Daddy, how come we don't have two cars? How come you and Mama have to share? Well, son, having two cars is what rich people have. Got it. I'm beginning to understand how this works. Whatever we don't have is because rich people have it. Okay, so there's something else that they've got. So then what we do? We had a radio. Then one day we got a television. How sweet was that? Few of you in here preceded televisions. Okay, um, so certainly we got our first television. Then it had to be a color TV. I was over at Billy's house. Their TV is in color. Well, son, that's what rich people have. Got it. I'm beginning to understand this. Then, my goodness, two TVs. Why would you have two TVs? That seems kind of stupid. We would have, here's the sofa, here's the chair, here's the rocker, and why would we have two TVs there? Hark, some people had what was called a family room or a den. What did we have? A living room. We had a kitchen in which we ate. Some people had like what we call a formal dining room. We didn't have any of those things. But I soon learned that the reason people had two TVs, count them, two TVs, is because they had a place for two TVs. They had a family room and a den. How come we don't have a den? Any idea of what my dad said? Son, those are things rich people have. Well, it's interesting. Ultimately, we got a den. We got a family room. And, ha, whew, whew, a second bathroom. That's incredible. I grew up with an older sister. Yeah, second bathroom. It, I didn't care if it was rich or not. I just knew that I had been delivered uh, by, by, by a good God um, because now we had a second bathroom and even though she would find a way to, to use both of them at the same time, um, I'm quite sure that began, to, uh, that began to save my life. And we don't even mention air conditioning or garage door opers, openers. How lazy are we that we won't get out of the car and raise the damn door? I mean, how lazy are we? How coddled are we as a society? Now, trust me, I have a home, full disclosure, we have three garages, we have two cars, we have garage door openers, okay? So that you know, um, and I really like my garage door openers. On the other hand, you know, I think too, when I was in Asia, there's people living under bridges. There's people trying to catch dead fish floating down the river just to have something to eat, and I've got a clicker that raises my garage door and I feel poor. Now how is that? I don't feel poor, 
but a lot of people do, and they have all of the stuff that rich people have. I know it's the stuff rich people had because that's what my dad taught me, okay? So let's take a look a little bit further in here. So what is the middle class? Middle class is defined in multiple ways, and so we're gonna work two different shots at what the middle class is and how we, how we define it. Sometimes it's defined by income. How much money do you make? That tells whether you are in middle class or not. But that's really deceptive. You make X amount of money and have nine children, someone can make half that much money and seem to have a whole lot more stuff and discretionary money. So how many kiddos you have makes a difference. Where you live makes a difference. You can live in Alamosa a quite a bit cheaper than you can live in many parts of Denver, okay? Just trying to find rental property uh, or homes to buy there. So income is a fair mathematical definition of middle class, eh, but there are so many variables that go with that. Then comes lifestyle. How middle class do we feel? How rich do we feel? Are we living the domestic life, as John Conley uh, sang for us? So we look at what the math says, and the math is on all different sizes of families. I kind of picked a four-person family. Everyone in here doesn't have a four-person family, nor didn't come from one, but those are somewhat standard, and it gives us a benchmark for comparison. So if we look at the four-person family, two wage earners, two kiddos, and of course, the Cocker Spaniel that, um, that John Conley sang about. Poverty level, $24,000 or less for a family of four, I'm with you. If you're a family of four and you're trying to make it in America and your combined income is about $24,000, you're not making it, okay? Is that fair? Doesn't mean you're not working hard, doesn't, doesn't mean any of those things, but what it means is you've got very little money. You probably won't get by with medical bills, food, uh, all of those transportation, all of those things without some type of assistance at, uh, at $24,000. I fully get that, okay? So let's take another leap. Then there's the working class, 24,000 to 48,000 uh, for a family of four. <clears throat> for perspective, $10 an hour is 20,000 a year. Okay, so if you're making 10 bucks an hour, that's about where, uh, that's about where you are. 12 bucks an hour, that's gonna get you up around 25,000 a year. So you add those two things together. Two adults working, $10 an hour, $12 an hour, 20,000, 25,000. That gets up real close here, almost to the very top of working class, almost into what we are going to argue is middle class. So let me tell you, just a few dollars more. Let's make it $11 an hour and $13 an hour. And by math, those good folks are middle class. Nah, let me tell you, they're probably not, okay? That's not that domestic life that they were hoping for. Um, that's 40, uh, close to $48,000 then, but family of four, $11 an hour, $13 an hour, those good people, hardworking people, are just barely getting by if they are. That is not a middle class lifestyle. Upper class starts at about $145,000. That we're gonna learn is gonna take us out of, uh, out of middle class. Upper class, $145,000, <clears> family of four. On up to Mark Zuckerberg, uh, 50 billion, um, Michael Bloomberg, 26 billion, um, middle class billionaires like Donald Trump, 7 billion. Um, and so upper class covers a lot of territory. I'm going to argue upper class, $145,000. You can't live well in a lot of nice cities on $145,000, much less be considered upper class, 
Okay? Does that make sense? That may be a lot of money to many of you in here, to many of us in here. That is a lot of money. Two adult working families bringing home $145,000, an attorney and a teacher, okay? Uh, upper class, are they flying um, first class every time they get on an airplane? Uh, do they have their own airplane? They don't have any of those things, okay? They may be doing pretty well, but that's a very deceitful number when we are told to think that that's kind of where upper class, upper class begins. Now, by way of comparison, understand when we talk about the 1%, and in a lot of the um, campaigns we talked about the 1%. The 1% is defined as those who earn $2 million a year or more, okay? So we know who those are. I'm okay with that. That's a lot of money. If you are earning $2 million a year or more, hmm, that's probably upper class. That actually is the 1%. Who does that? Uh, some professional athletes do that. Uh, singers, actors, and entertainers do that. Uh, corporate CEOs do that. And a whole lot of business owners do that. Uh, doctors, surgeons, attorneys, uh, some attorneys, um, there are people who, who do that. So that kind of peels off that group. So where we come down here, we leaped over from the working class to the upper class, and that leaves the middle class right there uh, for us. Household of four, somewhere between 48,000 and 144,000. Now, my thesis is those numbers are just all wrong. 48,000 trying to live in, um, in, in LA, trying to live in San Francisco on 48,000, two working adults, you are just flat, not middle class. I don't, you don't drive a middle class car, you don't have a middle class home, whatever those external materialistic indicators are, you're not saving a whole lot of money for your kid's college, uh, you're not doing any of those kinds of things that we might consider middle class to be able to, uh, to, be able to do. So I'm going to argue hmm, this number, eh, that number may have been okay in 1950 or 1960, but the federal definitions we get today, we get from organizations like the Pew uh, Foundation, um, they are just totally unrealistic, um, and there are other numbers that we probably should use. So let's go forward and talk about, but who is middle class by those definitions? Okay, first off, remember we're talking about 48,000 up to 145. Uh, most competent attorneys are going to be in there. Most uh, dentists and doctors are going to be in there or over that. A postal worker married to a nurse is typically a middle class lifestyle. A police officer married to a teacher, an electrician married to a hairstylist, a social worker married to a plumber. Just about everyone who works full time at Adams, if they have a working spouse, okay, just about, not everyone, but just about everyone at Adams um, is going to fall into that. And that's without even getting into all of the business owners um, who have a little bit of success and we might consider um, to be in the middle class. So, let's look at the real data, indicators, the metrics, the things that matter. <clears throat> the middle class is dying out. Um, one president after another has destroyed the middle class. Okay, who buys all the bottled water? There's very few things increasing in sales as fast as bottled water. Anybody in here buy bottled water? Uh, some of you do. Once again, appreciate the rich folks self-identifying. Um, there's people that drink out of the river because that's the water they got. And we are so wealthy that we can buy 16 ounces, 16.9 ounces, I think, if you buy it at Costco. We are so pampered, we drive to Colorado Springs or Albuquerque and bring back big things of, uh, of, of bottled water because we're too good to drink the water out of the tap. How sad is that on the, 
on the one hand. Uh, not going to touch that tap water. Who knows where that water's been? Uh, what I'm going to do, what does it say on the bottle? Filtered water. That's used water. Okay? That we just paid for in a bottle. I hate the idea that I'm paying extra money for used water. Who knows what it was used for, where it came from. It's just scary. Bottled water sales are up. Bottled water sales are exceeding uh, soda. And who buys bottled water? If you're making eight dollars, nine dollars, ten dollars an hour and buying bottled water, uh, you live in Flint, Michigan, or you're wasting your money. Okay? There's like two options there. Okay? Who buys bottled water? People that are getting along that have discretionary money to spend on water in a bottle. Okay? So. RV sales are exploding. Going to talk about that in a little bit. Elkhart, Indiana, where almost all of the RVs in America are made. Unbelievable economy. We're going to talk about how that impacts um, uh, the middle class. The rounds of golf played are down. Golf is, I'm not going to say a dying sport, but golf is definitely in a decline in the United States. Now, you would think, so that means that the middle class is down? No. I'm going to tell you my thesis, the middle class is up because golf is down. Okay? RVs are up, middle class is up, golf is down, middle class is up. Seems like I've got things wrong. I'm convinced I've got them exactly and precisely right. Wealth to income ratio is up. It is amazing. People who don't make a whole lot of money since the, uh, depending on how long they've been in, uh, in business and in working, um, some had an opportunity to make a whole lot of money during the Clinton years, the tech run up, all of those types of things, in their investments, retirement programs, uh, 401ks, 403bs, all of those 40-somethings that, um, uh, that we have. Um, Retirement plans that we never used to um, we, we never used to have except a company retirement plan since 2009 step by step property values if you're into property property values have um, have gone up and once again many investments have gone up those of you that follow it uh, the Dow's over 20,000 go figure who would have thought. Uh, amazing if you have money out there working for you. Many of you in this room do not yet. The reason you're going to school is so that you will get that middle class job, live the domestic life, and have money out there working for you and propel you into, uh, into that part of the economy. But more and more people, it's amazing. Someone making 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars a year, and they've got a quarter of a million dollars in uh, in mutual fund or in a um, in a tax sheltered annuity, and so they've got the wealth out there, uh, and it's it's unrelated directly to to their salary. Okay, and then people worldwide living in extreme uh, poverty is down. Doesn't really affect us except it is a prop that is uh, at as good. Reading here from a magazine called The Week. The Week is a compilation of all of the major news stories of the week. They attempt to be nonpartisan and collect news stories on multiple sides of an issue. Thanks to capitalism, the world's poor have been climbing out of poverty at the fastest rate in human history. That is a good thing. Over the past 30 years, the number of people in extreme poverty has dropped by 75%. That's a huge number, meaning 1.2 billion people worldwide have worked their way out of extreme poverty. Doesn't mean that they're not poor, but there is a difference between having no food in sight and just being poor. Okay, does that make, it, uh, make sense? So. First artifact we have, uh, we have played here. So those are some of the metrics that we are going to, um, that we are going to look at. Mm -hmm. Ah, Camping World goes IPO. Those of you that are not business majors, IPO, an initial public offering, the first time the company has sold stock, uh, their initial time out on the stock market, 
Camping World sells RVs. Um, their shares are up 10%, Wall Street Journal. Their revenue's up 25% in one year. 25%'s huge. Winnebago is up 44%. Thor, who makes a lot of RVs, is up 55%. Total RV shipments, 430,000 units, up 15% from the previous years. And these are the type of units that they tell us that they are, um, that they are looking at. Cited articles uh, what, uh, from the Atlantic, what RVs say about the American economy. Writing the RV boom uh, from the Wall Street Journal. And again, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, about camping world. Artifacts put into, uh, put into play. So let's talk about these. Um, those of you that know RVs, um, this would be a Class B, this would be a Class A, and these would be Class Cs. This RV here, this motorhome, exactly like the motorhome my wife and I had, um, had for some years, about 30 feet long, traveled with it, a, uh, traveled with it a quite a bit. Who buys RVs? They're, they are exploding. You look at these numbers. You drive up I-25. How many RV places do you see between, um, uh, where do we get on? We get on at Walsenburg. Between Walsenburg and Cheyenne, <laughs> how many RV places do you see? Who buys these? These aren't the 1%. These are not the half million dollar to two million dollar motor coaches that the uber wealthy uh, li uh, uh, travel in. These are RVs that mortals buy, that, that, that people, that, that working people who have that discretionary, uh, discretionary income. So let's look at a couple things here. When do you buy an RV when you feel financially secure? The RVs on the previous page run about 59,000. I can tell you exactly. Uh, my back them up button's not uh, backing them up. So let's see if I can back it up. There we go. 59,000 is going to start with this RV right here, brand new. The resale on them is not very good. You're going to be able to pick that up in five years used for 25,000. Eh, you don't buy them as an investment, okay? But that's about 59,000. I'll tell you exactly. Years ago, my wife and I bought ours for 49 to 50,000. Um, brand, brand new. Okay, this RV here is going to be about 79 uh, to 80 something thousand. Uh, this one's not bigger, but sometimes, depending on, they're putting a lot of them on Mercedes uh, uh, chassis and Mercedes engines. Uh, this one here looks like the big motor coaches, but it's a shorty. You can see there, it's going to run 89 to 99,000, something, like, uh, something like that. So, who buys those? Well, people, when they feel financially secure with their job, you don't buy one when you think you're going to get laid off. You don't buy one when you haven't had a pay raise in years and don't know if you're going to keep your job. Those aren't things that give you the confidence to do that. You buy them when you have discretionary income, either to make the purchase in cash or to take out the loan for that. Think expensive car. I'm just buying. 89,000, you can buy a Maserati for that. Um, your payments are going to be pretty high. The cool thing, if you like a lot of debt, it, ugh, we probably shouldn't like a lot of debt, but that when you buy RVs, they're more like homes. You can get 15-year loans on them as opposed to an automobile where you can get four, five, six, seven-year uh, year loans, okay? I recommend against getting 15-year loans on them. But you buy the IV, uh, the IV, the RV. People taking vacations is in and of itself a luxury concept. People coming across the Oregon Trail, settling the West, heading up for free land, uh, grew up in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma land rush, um, out there trying to stake out the worst dirt in the world because you got it for free. And um, it, it, I mean, you, you know the history. Of, uh, of that, when were they thinking about, you know, honey, think we should get us an RV? No, we've just traveled 3,000 miles in a prairie schooner. Going camping does not interest me. We've been camping and we've been shot at, drowned in the river, 
Um, so camping's really not what I'm thinking. All right, it's, it's just the whole luxury of that, uh, taking vacations. My daddy didn't ever not work two jobs and ever trying to get both jobs to mesh so we could take vacation was particularly difficult because if he got his two weeks from one job, it didn't line up with the two weeks he got from the other job. So we had a real hard time taking, why don't we ever get to vacation? Any idea what he said? Well, now, son, uh, vacations are what rich folks get to do. And so we understood that. Ultimately, he continued to work hard. We got to take, uh, va take vacation. So we think about that with RVs. The middle class is dying out. Well, who buys those? It's not the 1%. It's not people making $10 an hour, $11 an hour, $12 an hour. It's not people making um, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars a year, 60,000 dollars a year. They may be buying a used pop-up tent trailer. Uh, that's kind of a cool thing. We hadn't even talked about the big honking fifth wheels and travel trailers and toy haulers that you put all of your four-wheelers and your dirt bikes and all those kinds of things in. Poor people that can't feed their family, poor people that can't buy medicine at Walgreens, poor people that, that have to go to the church to get charity, to get a coat for their kiddo because it's 40 below outside, those aren't the people that are buying the RVs, buying the four-wheelers, buying the dirt bikes. It's the middle class that's doing that. And if all of the providers of that are exploding, what does that tell you about the class of people who's purchasing it? It has to be getting bigger, more secure, and have more discretionary money. Okay, so let's scoot past. Let's get right back. Where were we? And who the heck buys $400 long johns? Anybody in here know what long johns are? Let me put an artifact into play. <clears throat> have you heard of a company called Cabela's? Of course you have. A company called Bass Pro Shops. Of course you have. Bass Pro Shops recently bought Cabela's, just so that uh, you know. But you drive up I-25, and what do you see? Cabela's. This is their winter gear catalog. Free shipping. I would hope so. Here we go. The new X-Bionic Men's Cabela's Edition Energizer First On Skin Base Layer. That means long underwear. Thermoregulating, compression panels, odor neutralizing, because the deer and the elk will know. Top, $199.99. Bottom, $199.99. I'm rounding, but those are $400 long johns. Are you with me? Who buys $400 long johns at Cabela's? It's not the 1%. I don't think Bill Gates hunts. I don't think he snow machines. I don't think he does any of those kinds of things. Who does those things? The middle class. Or who does that? Who shops at Cabela's? It's not the uber poor. It's not $10 an hour and $14 an hour that shops there. It's people living the middle class and they keep building more Cabela's. That tells me there's more people in those income levels that can afford these types of things. It's amazing. What an incredible thing. $400 is more than, the, uh, than some people make in a year around the world, and you spend it on a pair of long johns. Uh, $400 is more than many people have to spend on all of their kids' clothing for the entire year. And I say you, we, I, spend it on long johns. Okay? So that tells us as RVs go, so goes the economy. As the price of winter underwear goes, so goes the economy, and so it dictates to the, um, uh, the, the middle class. All right, now let's talk about golf courses. Oh my goodness. It's not the sport of kings. Thoroughbred racing is the sport of kings, but it is the sport of business, okay? It is where deals are cut. It is where promotions are made. Years ago, 
they told women coming out of the Ivy League business schools, the way through the grass glass ceiling is to break your way through it with a golf club. Meaning, you need to be able to, when the men go to the golf course, you need to go to the golf course with them and hold your own there, okay? That made, made sense. Golf came to the U.S. in uh, 1890. It was founded in the 1400s in Scotland. Um, was soon adopted by the business magnates, the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, those types of people, the Rockefellers, became golfers, the wealthy and upper middle classes, and they built private golf clubs. Um, now, when we talk about golf clubs, I'm not talking about golf clubs. I'm talking about golf courses and places to go. Okay, everybody with me? So, the route to making it then, teeing up your life and your career, get a college degree, buy a home, start your family, join a country club. Hey, Daddy, how come we don't belong to a country club? Got any idea what the answer to that was? Well, that's what rich folks do. They get to belong to country clubs. We don't because we're not that rich. Eh, country clubs today, I'm not gonna poo-poo them, but you can buy in for $5,000, you can pay monthly fees of $200 or $300, and that gets you all the rounds of golf you can play. That's not really a bad deal for a middle-class person who's gonna play four or five rounds of golf a, a month anyway, okay? Because that's gonna cost you money. Um, Trump, uh, Donald Trump owns 18 golf courses around the world. Average greens fee at a Trump golf course is $500. Okay. Eh, that's for the rich people. I'm convinced. Um, but what do we have? So many municipal golf courses, uh, public golf courses, where we can, uh, we can play. But this used to be the thing. We had to play golf to make it in, uh, to make it in business. Uh, but, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, there we go. However, the most recent data that we find, 2013, uh, 25 million people in the U.S. played golf. All right. And that was down 18% from 2006, while the population in the U.S. was increasing by 6%. So rounds of golf is down year after year and continues to be down. 2013, 160 golf courses closed across the U.S. They're still building golf courses. They're still closing golf courses. Each year we have a net loss of golf courses in the U.S. Nike, they have pretty much, they do some golf, um, of course, they lost their high-profile sponsor, their marketing sponsor, Tiger Woods, when he had the uh, girlfriend eruption um, that happened. But um, the golf fortunes are down, and they have greatly reduced their investment in golf itself. Dick Sporting Goods. Um, you go in to get sized and fitted for golf clubs and dicks, and they've got the indoor range and the cameras and all those kinds of things. Ripping that out. Um, and laid off hundreds of people across, uh, across the U.S. And many other companies are reducing their golf profile because fewer and fewer people are playing golf. Okay, you got that. But what's that got to do with the middle class growing? Let's talk about that. As the economy and individual wealth increases, fewer young middle classers are playing golf. There are reasons. One is, they have money for other discretionary things. When golf was growing so fast, we didn't have all the RVs, all the four-wheelers, all of the dirt bikes, all the way cool toys that we have now. We have so many outdoor toys now, it's unbelievable. And so that has cut into golf. People with discretionary income. Millennials, eh, they won't spend four hours doing anything. Um, much less spend four hours playing 18 holes of golf. Now, if they're going to play four hours, they're going to want like 200 holes of golf. I only get 18 for four hours. I'll go out there and play for 30 minutes, and uh, then I'm out of here. So, you know, that's, uh, there's a generational problem, okay? However, the big, this is, uh, could be me, except that's a lefty, but sometimes you can't tell 
uh, out there in uh, Marlboro country hacking at the ball, uh, hoping not to get snake bit. Um, with so many public and municipal golf courses, so many middle classers with money, golf's just no longer special. And that's the key. Golf used to be the way up the um, up to the corner suite, uh, the way up to the top, and today, go figure. Let's look at this. And I say this jokingly. Now we let women play. Okay? That changed the prestige of it when it used to be the business men uh, who would play and drink their scotch and smoke their cigars and have their own private world. That world has changed. Okay? But today, so many middle classers with money, they look at it and, eh, golf's just not special. The common man, the common woman can't afford to play golf. There's municipal clubs where green fees for seniors are 18 bucks. You're kidding me. Anybody can play golf. But certainly um, middle class. But the middle class has actually turned its head and moved on from golf when you would think with all of the money they have, they would be supporting golf, but it's because they have the money. All of the independent businesses, they don't have to play golf to work their way up. They invented software, they invented a process, they started a company, they're making their $400,000, $600,000, $800,000 a year, which is still a middle class lifestyle. Those aren't one percenters. Uh, someone making $800,000 a year, um, uh, living in San Francisco, they are not the uber wealthy. They're doing very well, but they don't have their Lear jets. Um, they don't have a driver. They don't have those types of things. They may be able to afford, um, be able to afford a nanny. Okay, so golf loses its mystique. It loses its mojo. It was that special thing that doctors played, that lawyers played during the week. Hacks would go out on the weekend and uh, play a little bit. And that's when I started golf, loved it, could only play on weekends, quit it because I hated it. Um, the pressure on the courses, you had to be good, all those types of things. When I was able to play during the week, when I got clubs that fit, all those types of things, how did I get to do those things? Because I had moved into a middle class lifestyle where I could afford those things, I still play golf, I'm hanging on, I'm gonna save it, I'm just gonna hit harder and further and longer, and uh, maybe, it'll, uh, maybe it'll be okay. So, the middle class, Joe Biden, <clears throat> artifact. Dems ignored the middle class in 2016 campaign. It's a huge article. Here's what happens, Hillary Clinton, running away from President Obama's record. Okay, full disclosure, I'm a Republican. I did not support Hillary Clinton. Okay, so she runs away from President Obama's record. The truth is, President Obama's record for the middle class was pretty good. It was not necessarily good if you looked at the uh, coal mining, which Mr. Trump looked at. If you looked at air conditioning manufacturing, which Mr. Trump looked at, there were manufacturing sectors that were not doing particularly well, but the middle class in general, the economy in general, had done pretty well. Uh, Mrs. Clinton ran away from that uh, when I would have argued, she did not call and ask, I would have argued she should have run toward it. Okay, so what did the, uh, what did the uh, GOP run on? That Obama failed the middle class. We accepted that as, a, um, uh, as a, a, a truth, um, when in reality, household wealth has soared since the first quarter of 2009, household wealth has soared by 38 trillion. Trillion's a big word, okay? Now, a little bit of that is real estate, okay? So for people who own real estate. But household net worth reaches a record of 92 trillion, that's incredible. How did it reach 92 trillion? The 1% the can't earn enough money to do that, okay? 
Billionaires are chump change when we start looking at those, at those numbers. There's not enough of them to affect that. People making eight, nine, 10, 12, 14 dollars an hour, they're not coming up with those numbers. It is that middle tier. And by middle tier, it is a more realistically skewed middle tier with middle class. I don't have an exact number, but it's not starting at $48,000. It's going to start at $60,000 for a family of four or $75,000 for a family of four, and it's going to run up pretty high. Okay, okay some of the numbers that we have, uh, we have talked about. The middle class, especially those earning over 100000 is larger and richer than ever. The upper middle class, now we're talking about um, 400,000 a year, 600,000 a year, successful doctors. Uh, and successful means a lot of different things, but successful doctors in cities where they would have that kind of, that kind of a practice. Uh, uh, very successful attorneys, uh, people that have started good, thriving uh, businesses. Many people who are in that uh, $400,000, $600,000 a year, and especially talking about a two-income family, the upper middle class has more than doubled since 1979. Hey, okay. if I'm advising Mrs. Clinton, I was not. Although I did give her some advice during the campaign, she likely wouldn't have liked it. Um, but um, I would have advised her, run on those numbers. Fight back and say, Mr. Obama's middle class is doing just fine. Mr. Trump's arguing against it. Let's look at the numbers. Okay. And I think she could have made an argument, um, an argument for that. All right. So upper middle class more than doubled since 1979. <clears throat> and that $92 $800,000 for net worth uh, middle class in the United States, that's a whole lot of garages. That's a whole lot of two-car garages. That's a whole lot of garage door openers. That's a whole lot of bottled water, um, a whole lot of color TVs, a whole lot of family rooms, second bathrooms and air conditioners. And you look at where we started out, my journey from 1950 to today's journey, when we talk about how uh, there is no middle class, it is dying out, when the truth is, I could argue, there's a whole lot of people that would be middle class in this group, although I'm arguing that we have moved on from that, uh, uh, from that group. And that, my friends, comes to the conclusion that the middle class, I would offer you, is doing just fine. So we'll just have a little uh, closing music. I would be more than happy um, to answer any questions, if you wish. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Herman, Would you say that I can't hear you. Somebody's playing music. No. <laughs> In theory, it has to. In theory, it just has to. And so then, yeah, you're asking for an opinion. I don't, have, I don't have data. The more we solve poverty, the more the world ought to be fair. The more it seems like it would be peaceful. There is an argument, the same thing as we argue with education, which is a terrible argument, those of us involved in education. The more we take civilizations that have zero formal education. We move them out of extreme poverty into where they actually can access some of the resources of the world. I think there is a theory that human jealousy begins to take over and actually they then want more and more as I did in this country as a child and that can create a feeling of bitterness over disparity. So we end poverty without income redistribution of some uh, e e e um, 
egalitarian effort across the world, and I think it can have an opposite effect. Okay? I don't favor income redistribution, but that would be one theory I would put forth. Okay? Thank you. Other questions? We got the room till 10 and we're staying. <laughs> Other questions at all? We good? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.